Greetings on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. For today's worship from St. Martin's Episcopal Church in Williamsburg, Virginia, I'm joined by Amy Harris, Ken Lalonde, John Lavecki, and Kay Russell, and I'm Lisa Green. Our music is led by Phaedra McNorton and the St. Martin's Choir. I invite you to create your worship space before we begin. You might want to light a candle or put a cross or some flowers in view. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The lesson today is taken from a reading from Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. As he dreamed, there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. As the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread about to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you, and I will be with you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I do not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? That This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and set it upon a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. He called that place, place Bethel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read from Psalm 139, responsibly by half verse. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. 
if I make the grave my bed, you were there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the other moats parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light around me turn to night. Darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. Search me out, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know that my restless thoughts Look well whether there be any wickedness in me and lead me in the way that is everlasting. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, for the creation was subjected to fertility, not of its own will, but the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now, Hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. i
the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus put before the crowd another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We're in the middle of three weeks of parables in the gospel readings for these Sundays of July. And as David Boyd said last week, we're also in the middle of a time that feels parabolic. We're surrounded by events we don't understand, seismic changes that have overturned our sense of normalcy and safety. I've been thinking a lot this week about the line David quoted from the Bible scholar William Barclay, a parable reveals truth to those who desire truth and conceals truth from those who do not wish to see the truth. And that's all of us, isn't it? Both of those, if we're honest, desiring truth one minute and running from it the next. So a parabolic approach to life, a willingness to hold the tension of paradox, uncertainty and incompleteness is something to cultivate as followers of Jesus. He says as much in the verses the lectionary jumps over last week and this week. The disciples ask, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus basically says to keep them guessing for the next 2,000 years. It's good for us. Seeing is not the same as perceiving. Hearing is not the same as listening or understanding. As the fox says in The Little Prince, it's only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eyes parables and living parabolically, we might say, help hone that heart vision so that we can see what is essential. In this week's Missing Verses, Matthew quotes Psalm 78 to suggest that Jesus uses parables to proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. Our prayer book translation of that line is the mysteries of ancient times. Either way, it sounds good. And since I love that sense of mystery and complexity, to be honest, I wish the lectionary skipped over the verses last week and this week where Jesus explains the parables to the disciples. Rocky ground means this, the thorns are the cares of the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, the weeds are the children of the evil one, the enemy is the devil, the reapers are angels. These explanations turn the parables into allegories where each thing stands for something. 
And that allows us to distance ourselves from them. We're definitely not children of the evil one, we think, so we must be good seed, case closed. And that tidy approach dilutes the power of parables to help train us for complexity. So in that spirit, let's take a look at this week's parable of the wheat and the weeds. Someone sows good seed in his field, but when the plants come up, weeds also appear. And the slaves ask where the weeds came from, and the householder says, an enemy has done this. Should we go and gather them? No, that would uproot the wheat too. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. We can think about this parable in a few different ways. On one hand, on a cosmic scale, it's engaging the question of evil. Why are there weeds? Why are there bad things in the world? Disease, injustice, violence, loss, suffering, pain. This is a time when many of us may be asking these big questions, perhaps resonating with Paul's imagery in that letter to the Romans that we heard, the whole creation feeling subjected to futility, longing to be set free from our bondage to decay, groaning in labor pains, waiting for redemption, trying to live in hope and patience. With COVID-19 again on the rise locally and nationally and internationally, many are struggling with weighty questions that get at the heart of how we live and work and care for our children or our elders, how we tackle the division and inequity in our society. I could feel the heft of all those questions and responsibilities when I carved out a little time for contemplative prayer this past week. And Diane shared these words from Psalm 131. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul is like the weaned child that is with me. O oh Israel, hope in the Lord from this time on and forevermore. So soothing. And I think there's something similar about this parable that gives a wider frame to our human struggles to understand and eradicate the evils around us. Those cosmic questions are ultimately bigger than we are. And while that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility to stand up for the good, it does put it in a larger context. As they say, for peace of mind, resign as general manager of the universe. God is God and we're not. At a more human level, the parable invites us to question our inclination to othering, our certainty that we're the wheat and they, those other people who don't get it, are the weeds. I listened to an episode of On Being the other day and Krista Tippett, the host said, at this moment in our life together, there's a lot of judging other people, thinking, can't they just get their act together? Can't they just see the truth? Can't they just hear the facts? And it happens on every side. There's probably someone or a group of people whose very existence feels like a nuisance to you. You don't even want to understand them. They're unwelcome. They seem to threaten your flourishing. Should we go and gather them? Tempting, but no, because that would uproot us as well. Grow together into the harvest. Let God sort it out. And finally, I think the parable speaks to us on an internal spiritual level about the wheat and the weeds within us. I've been thinking a lot about Jung's concept of the shadow since Catherine Meeks talked about it in our conversation more than a month ago. And it came up this past week in the chapter of her book that we're reading for our Wednesday night discuss discussion group. 
we all have problematic, immature, unhealed parts of ourselves that complicate our lives and our relationships, including our relationship with God. Our impulse <clears throat> is to try and root this shadow side out or suppress it, keep it hidden. But not only does this do violence to our psyches, we also often end up displacing it onto other people. It's better to recognize, as John Levecki writes in his poem, When Trouble Knocks, that our challenges, our weeds, are often accompanied by our wheat, the very things that we most need to get through life. He concludes this way. Because without you knowing, trouble brought along your allies too. And now they surround, uphold you, resilience, resolve, strength, humility, grit, persistence. You once thought he came as your enemy, when all along he was always, always, always simply your guide. Cultivating a nonviolent, compassionate, loving, kind, and gentle approach to ourselves to others and ultimately to the world, helps us to see the truth. It helps us even want to see the truth, those mysteries that are otherwise invisible to the eyes. And the healing doesn't stop there. If we cooperate with God's grace, amazing things are possible. In the long run, Catherine Meeks writes, the community will be strengthened by the personal power and energy generated by the persons who are living with better integration between their hearts and heads and with less reason to project anything either negative or positive onto anyone else. They will be more confident in claiming their own weakness and their own power and will find it completely unnecessary to assign anything to another person. In this type of environment, there is great opportunity for the beloved community to develop, a place where people see the face of God in one another and know that each time they encounter another person, God is present. Let us pray. Search us out, O God, and know our hearts. Try us and know our restless thoughts. Look well whether there be any wickedness in us, and lead us in the way that is everlasting. Amen. As we enter into prayer in the midst of these unsettled times, let us pause in silence to gather our burdens and concerns, and bring them together into the burdens and concerns of God's heart. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. God of love, we pray for our and your church, for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan and Jay, our bishops, for all lay and ordained ministers, especially Kathy and Lisa, and for all who seek you in the community of the faithful. Equip us with compassion and love to carry out your work of reconciliation in the world. God of love, hear our prayers for the church. God of freedom, we pray for our nation and all nations. We pray for peace and unity across barriers of language, color, and creed. For elected and appointed leaders, that they would serve the common good, inspire all people with courage to speak out against hatred, to actively resist evil. Unite the human family in the bonds of love. God of freedom, hear our prayer for the world. God of justice, 
We pray for the earth, your creation entrusted to our care, for the animals and birds, the mountains and oceans, and all parts of your creation that have no voice of their own. Stir up in us a thirst for justice that protects the earth and all its resources, that we may leave to our children's children the legacy of beauty and abundance that you have given us. God of justice, hear our prayer for the earth. God of peace, we pray for this community, for our local leaders, for our schools and markets, for our neighborhoods and workplaces. Kindle in every heart a desire for equality, respect, and opportunity for all. Give us courage to strive for justice and peace among all people, beginning here at home. God of peace, hear our prayers for this community. God of mercy, we pray for all in any kind of need or trouble, especially for those most affected by those things, the pandemic of COVID-19 and racial injustice, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially for the Hodges and Disabella families, Mary Gumas, Mary Hawthorne, Brent, Holly, Grace, Tom, Mark, Mary, the Cooper family, and Tim Owens. God of mercy, hear our prayers for all who are in need. God of grace, we give thanks for the life of Frances Hodges, sister of Sue Ducebella, and all those who have died. We thank you for the faithful in every generation who have worked for justice, for prophets who called us to racial reconciliation, for martyrs who died because of hatred, and for all the communion of saints. Make us faithful to your call to proclaim your good news by word and example, and bring us at last into the glorious company of the saints in light. God of grace, hear our prayers for those who have died. Look with compassion, O Heavenly Father, upon the people in this land who live with injustice, terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Have mercy on us. Help us to eliminate our cruelty to these our neighbors. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunities for all. And grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair portion of the riches of this land. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Almighty God, source of all that is, giver of every good gift, you create all people in your image and call us to love one another as you love us. We confess that we have failed to honor you in the great diversity of the human family. We have desired to live in freedom while building walls between ourselves and others. We have longed to be known and accepted for who we are while making judgments of others based on the color of skin or the shape of features or the varieties of human experience. We have tried to love our neighbors individually while yet benefiting from systems that hold those same neighbors in oppression. Forgive us, holy God. Give us eyes to see you as you are revealed in all people. Strengthen us for the work of reconciliation rooted in love. Restore us in your image to be beloved community, united in our diversity, even as you are one with Christ and the Spirit, holy and undivided Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen.
Let us pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. By way of announcements, just a big thank you to my fellow worship leaders this week, Amy and John and Kay and Ken. Thank you so much. Thank you to those who, by the time you see this, uh, will have finished emptying the zigzag building uh, on Saturday morning. Thank you to our vestry, who uh, had a tough but ultimately productive meeting last night, and to our rector, Kathy Boyd, who's taking some well-deserved vacation time this week and, and part of next. And um, I invite you now, uh, when I will offer the sign of peace, to share the peace with those you might have uh, around you as you're participating in the service, or if not, I invite you to call or text or Zoom with someone at a distance and to know that even if you are alone as we uh, have this worship together, we are all connected in the, commun the communion of saints. The peace of the Lord is always with you. Peace. Peace to all of you. May the peace that passes all understanding be in your hearts and minds and the knowledge and love of God and his son, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.